And welcome in to the Backstage Pass here for a Thursday. Hard to believe the week has almost come to an end, and it's the middle of April out there. Again, uh, definitely just uh, trucking along here on the show, trying to get as much in as we can to finish out the week, and some more great shows coming up uh, next week. And we're going to be at Whitewater Amphitheater on the 24th of April. Uh, Josh Ward, Randall King out there. Looking forward to seeing those guys uh, play some hockey talk. We're just looking forward to get back to a live show. We're presented by our good friends over at uh, Tour Guitars. Check them out at tourguitars.us and also Bangtail Whiskey, bangtail.com, or you can download the Easy Liquor app and get your bottle uh, sent directly to your door. Brandon Morell, Jeff McMahon here on the show, and I uh, want to thank our first guest today, Katie Jane, for stopping by, and now pleased to welcome in here on the Backstage Pass, you know her, you love her, Miss Catherine Britt, and good morning, Miss Catherine. Good morning. You had Katie Jane <laughs> on here before me. Oh, I missed we her. did. Yeah, she <laughs> had a great show there, too, and always good to catch up. Yeah with some great Australian country artists. I'm putting you right up there. This latest album, Home Truths, is a masterpiece of work out there. I love it. Everything on there is just fantastic. You really can uh, connect as a fan with, with those songs. But let's, let's start at the top here because a lot of people, you've been on this journey, and this journey has lasted for 20 years. You were in Nashville and, of course, now back in, in Australia. And I know this was the first album that you released in about 20 years to put out this uh, length of work. Um, just talk about, I guess, the the condensed version, some people would say, but uh, talk about your journey just in music and, and how this album came together. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> that yeah, that's actually, it's my first independent album in 20 years. I've been yeah. producing music for the last um, 20 years, but um, yeah, it's just been, been a crazy life. I guess I started out really young and singing here in my hometown in Newcastle, which is where I live, um, in the city here in, in on the beach in the east coast of Australia. And um, I grew up singing at local little, you know, country music clubs and things like that. And I was very encouraged by my, my folks who were big country fans, my dad particularly. And um, yeah, I just got into it really young, met the Chambers, um, Casey Chambers and her father when I was little. Um, mm -hmm. They're pretty big stars here in Australia and they kind of took me under their wing at a young age and then uh, developed, you know, my EP when I was 14. I re recorded a little EP of some songs I'd written to that point and then made a little album at 16 and that got picked up by a, a dude, um, you probably never heard of him, um, he's quite unpopular, um, he's named Elton John. Um, he picked up the album and then um, helped me get a record deal over in America and I moved over there at 17. I was so young, um, so naive, so green and signed to RCA Records and did the whole you know, American, um, go around to all the radio station tour and all that, um, went on the road with Brooks and Dunn and Alan Jackson and it was a great experience. And then uh, I was about 23 when I came back to Australia to make another record and um, decided not to go back. Um, I Look, I was so homesick the whole time I was there and I love the US. Now I'm homesick for America because I haven't been able to come there for so long and I'm, all my friends are suffering. My, my best friend lost her father to COVID and I'm really missing being over there. So um, can I come back yet? Is it over? <laughs> hey, hey. It. <laughs> come on back. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have any COVID in Australia, so I don't know if I want to I want to wait, but um, look, I'm, I'm excited to get back over there and I, I really do miss it so much. It's a very special place to me. So. Yeah. Well, okay. So I have to ask you, um, uh, I, I, I'm a piano player and, uh, I was on the road with, uh, McGraw for a while. And yeah. there was a point where we got, we recorded our version of tiny dancer, which of oh, course yeah. is a big, is a big Elton John song. Totally. Now, now at the time I did that song, I didn't know who Elton John was for 20 years. Yeah. And I was a piano player, so I was completely overwhelmed by the mm. the idea of being a part of that. But Elton John never knew my name. He never dedicated a song to me from the stage. <laughs> he never knew me. I mean, when all that was Roger. happening for you, when, when all that was happening for you, yeah. did you recognize how significant he was in the industry at that time? Well, <clears throat> I guess I did and I didn't, you know, I was 17, so I don't think I really grasped fame even, you know, or what that meant or um, I was so sheltered, I still lived at home, you know, I was, um, yeah, I don't think I really understood totally what, what that meant. Uh, I mean, and to me, 
Elton John was somebody I heard around the house growing up that my dad played. He was the dude that did The Lion King, you know, like I was, I grew up on Disney. Right. So to me, it wasn't like I knew every song and I was a big fan. Um, right. And I think he knew that when I met him, he was like, um, you know, can you stay and watch what I do? Um, I'd love to, you to see what I do. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, I'd love that. I think, so, I think he kind of knew I was just a kid and I probably had no real concept of, you know, exactly who he was. Um, and he really was just so kind to me. He had no ego. Um, and it's funny, you see all this stuff in the media about him being like this big diva and all these horrible things. And you're like, he's the nicest, kindest, most giving yeah. person, you know, like he would have done anything for me. Um, mm -hmm. and, he, I, I've, and who the hell was I? Nobody, like a little girl from Newcastle. And he sang a duet with me, like, why? I, I still don't know why. <laughs> like, I question, I question why he did that all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, the, the one, I, I've been around him a couple of times, but it was always just in larger environments. It wasn't like, yeah, it wasn't like your situation. You know, I was, right. I just happened to be in the zip code with him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. but um, yeah, I I just I kind of wondered, you know, what your perspective was. I forgot about the Lion King. That makes total sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a big impact on me. You know, like growing up, that was probably the biggest movie of my time until I was a teenager, and then Titanic came out. But you mm -hmm. know, yeah. when I was growing up, I went to the Lion King like so many times at the movies, and he was my hero because the music in mm -hmm. that was changed my life. You know, it was sure. so well written and it was so catchy and. So sing alonging and, um, you know, I kind of started out loving that music and then I found country mm -hmm. music at about nine years old. But before that, it was all about Disney. So right. he was a part of that for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love what you did. And I, it's how long I've been following you now. Good. Probably six years. Uh, Bone Shaker came out. Oh, yeah. Some great songs on there too, including the title track. And then uh, Take It Easy. Talk about just the, the making of, a uh, bone shaker and the studio, the production, everything. Cause I know you like to also have a hand in producing your own albums. Yeah. Um, I mostly these days produce my own stuff. Um, that album actually was uh, produced. I stepped back and um, it was produced by a guy by the name of Ryan Hadlock, uh, who was based in Seattle, Washington. Um, Ryan had worked with a few of my um, colleagues on my label here in Australia. There's a really big artist here called Vance Joy. Um, who was having hits on the radio here in Australia on pop radio. Um, but it was really good, you know, soulful, um, great folk pop. And I could see the songs I was writing on Bone Shaker really felt like it needed that sort of folk pop aspect, you know, as well as the countryside. Um, so we reached out to him. Um, he'd also done Brandy Carlisle, who I was a big fan of, uh, and the Lumineers, who I was a huge fan of as well. And they're all doing really great things. You know, the Lumineers had, had that big hit on the radio at the time. So we reached out and he loved my songs and um, thankfully agreed to do the project. So I flew over to Seattle and stayed in his uh, log cabin for about a month and we made a record together and it was amazing. You know, we had some incredible musicians and uh, it was one of my favorite records to make. It was quite different. Every record I make is different to the other one. And I like that, you know, I like to show diversity and I like to all different types of music, you know, it all has the, my voice and my songs at the at the core of it but mm -hmm. you know the the sort of sound i guess changes from album to album and home truce is different again you know that kind of reminds me of my early stuff you know like when i first came out in the late 90s early 2000s you know the country music that was going on at that time you know the dixie chicks which are now the chicks um and stuff like that you know really impacted me so yeah it's really influenced by that sort of era That's good well and and a lot of your stuff <clears throat> i I, I kind of touched things all along the way. I have not yet been through everything, but I'm I'm really looking forward That's to okay, digging deeper because no no no, but it's great. But but it's so fun because um, I will uh, I will speak somewhat to the circle of life um, <laughs> um, for you because am, am I correct? Was your first studio album that you did in Nashville was that the little wildflower record? No, too far gone. No. Too far gone. Nashville. You did in Nashville. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So those two it, were done in Nashville. Okay. Um, because I know that, I mean, there's a lot of your stuff throughout, you've really hung on to a lot of that traditional stuff. Yeah. And, um, I didn't know the first record, but I know little wildflower, um, 
was Brett Beavers who did all that Dirk Spentley stuff yeah. back then. Yeah. Um, uh, more importantly, he played bass with me in my in my band when he and I were in college together. Oh, really? Yeah. Back was, in the day. He's a great musician too. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, but I I I would certainly think that when you come into Nashville, you could have been taken into a really really heavier pop direction, and I would mm. think that uh, y'all really got to kind of explore more of where you are comfortable with that traditional thing that seems like you've really tried to keep a flavor of throughout. Yeah. Is that accurate or? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. <clears throat> look, I think I was a different, a different kettle of fish for them. Um, when they flew me over at 17, it was actually Joe Galanti and um, Renee Bell were the two that I met with at RCA Records. And um, this is, of course, before it was Sony BMG. It was just BMG um, and Arista and, and RCA. And um, they... Flew me over with my dad because I was too young to sign a contract. I was 17. Um, and my manager here in Australia. And I remember walking the halls of the um, record label and I saw Sarah Evans on the wall. And I'm a, um, when she released that first record, Three Chords and the Truth, I mean, I was like, oh, my God, that is a great record. And I was so into what she did. And then she started releasing music that was super, like, commercial and really didn't seem like it suited her. And I thought, oh my God, these are the people that changed Sarah Evans. And I was super mad. And I was like, I don't want to be here, dad. I don't want to be here. These people changed Sarah Evans. She was great. They're going to make me a pop singer. And I don't want to be a pop singer. I love country music. And I flipped out. And then we went into the meeting and I said all of this to Joe Galani. I was like, I am not here to be changed. I can just go home to Australia. I have a career in Australia. I don't want to, I didn't even want to come to Nashville. You know, like I was a 17 year old. Um, <clears throat> but I, I said all this stuff and Joe goes, oh, we love you because of your album that we heard that you made in Australia. We want that. We want to recreate that for you. We don't want to change you. That's not what we want to do here. And I think my label experience, my major label experience in Nashville was so different to my friends and colleagues. So I've got a child coming. Um, <laughs> hello, child. Um, and I, yeah, I think talking to my friends and stuff, I thought, oh, wow, I, I'm in a totally different world than they are. You know, they were being forced to record music they didn't want to record. They were um, making, you know, music they didn't, that weren't there, wasn't them, you know. Um, and I never had that experience. I always had a really nurtured, uh, wonderful uh, time with RCA Records. They really believed in my music. They nurtured my songwriting. They encouraged me to do my first co-writing. I'd never co-written before. Thank you, Mum. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, they were really wonderful to me. So I fought tooth the nail, um, to keep that sound, to keep my, um, my, I guess, credibility, you know, I really wanted mm -hmm. to, to still be a true artist that was true to myself and that made music that reflected who I was. And, and in some ways it's probably why I never really worked over there, you know, because I never really compromised. I never really gave in to what I had to, you know, when I was releasing music, Taylor Swift broke and I saw why that made sense. Um, speaking of Tim McGraw, I remember hearing that on the mm -hmm. radio and going, oh, wow, okay, um, that's not going to work. And then it did, you know, and then all this other stuff that, you know, just kept breaking at the time that I was there, I, it just, I went, yeah, I get why I'm not working. You know, Gretchen Wilson, Redneck Woman broke another time when I released a single and I think I was just, you know, the Aussie girl that, that was making <laughs> real country music and they were like, eh, I don't know if we're going to put her on the radio. Um, but, you know, I'm okay with that. You know, I ended up coming back to Australia and I have a fabulous career here and I still get to tour America once a year and I play to those fans that, that heard mm -hmm. me on the radio that loved what I did and I have that core fan base and it's like, what more would you want in life? You know, I never had to compromise and I sleep really well at night. So, I don't know. I think that's a better life. <laughs> well, it's a yeah. beautiful album, and I can tell you whether it's the authenticity and uh, the direct, the personal feel that you get from it, and you understand why it's called Home Truths. And uh, time for some music here. I'm going to let you yeah. uh, have dealer's <laughs> choice, and there's so many great songs. I listened to the whole thing um, ever since it came out and love every uh, song on there, too. So, mm -hmm. Catherine, it is all yours. All right. Well, I thought I might start with um, the first single. It's, you know, all in the head voice, so we'll see how we go at this time in the morning. Um, <laughs> but this 
this is single number one. Actually, this was inspired by uh, a friend of mine, in, my best friend in Nashville. Um, she <laughs> She's super... Uh, Southern. She grew up in Mississippi, and she always picks me up from the airport when I when I land in America. And she uh, has a very interesting life. She's been through some crazy stuff, and at the time I got there, she'd been through some really heavy stuff. And I said, "Oh, Teresa, how are you? What's going on? You know, tell me, fill me in. What's going on in America? What what's been played on the radio? What have I missed? Come on, tell me everything." And she looked at me with this really dry face, and just said. Um, oh girl, I don't need the radio to tell me what's wrong. I am a country song. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, that's an amazing song title. I'm writing that down. So I put it in my phone and when I came to writing this record, I uh, came up with this one. So here we go. Yep.
you're looking for one of the most beautiful and playable custom acoustics on the planet, look no further than Ed Rice at Toe Ear Guitars. Ed is a true artist, transforming exotic woods into magnificent, sweet-sounding instruments. Go to toeirguitars.us, that's T-O-I-R-G-U-I-T-A-R-S dot U-S, and contact Ed today. And back here on the show with the wonderful, the talented, Catherine Britt. Hang on, hang on, hey. hang on. sorry, hang oh. on just a minute. Uh, yes, ma'am, yeah. yes, ma'am. No, everything's everything's fine here. Uh, it was it was a false alarm. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Apparently, all the alarms started going off all over the country. Um, I'm I'm not really sure why that is, but uh, apparently, your song set off all the alarms. So, right? Okay. Wow. Is that a good or a bad thing? I'm not even sure. <laughs> well, now, okay. So here's the thing. Now I'm being funny, uh, but but maybe you don't know this. We heard an alarm on your end. Ah. Oh. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe you had oh. headphones on and you didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't hear it. Yeah. I think there was a truck going up in the city. <laughs> I think there was a truck going down the alleyway behind where I live because I kind of heard a beeping and I was like, I wonder if they can hear that. Apparently you can. Yep. It's, it's <laughs> all the alarms going off in Nashville. City yeah. laugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I get, I, I'll echo those sentiments too because it don't matter if it's five o'clock in the morning or 8 30 there in your home country, you can sing like the Dickens and that song right there. Uh, no wonder it's leading off the album. Uh, I'm a country song with the great Catherine Britt here. Home Truths is the album across all the digital uh, platforms. You blew it away, and I was just texting Jeff. I said, man, if she ever gets to Nashville and we're there, uh, we're coming to a show as a guest, and we're going to be there doing some live stuff with her. You're super, super talented. That's how good this album is. I'm just uh, Thank you. just blown away by it. Um, i tell you, one of the songs you did um, with a gentleman that we're going to get here on the show, hopefully at a future date, uh, the great Lee Kernigan and yeah. Country Fan. And that blew yeah. me away with the duet. Uh, talk about that one, how it came together. Yeah, well, during COVID, um, we sort of had a pretty intense lockdown here in Australia um, early on when it all sort of hit in Australia around mid to late March. Um, I was on the road. I was doing a, I do this tour around Australia called the Bush Pubs Tour um, where we go bush, basically, um, mm -hmm. which, like, uh, well, you, you know what that means, right? Go bush, mm -hmm. like go to, go into the woods, yes. yeah. Uh, except it's not woods, it's outback. It's outback. <laughs> so, yeah, it's like <laughs> desert. Um, so we go into these little towns and play in these tiny little pubs that are like isolated areas and they're really small communities, often Aboriginal communities um, and, you know, just really small towns that are sort of basically all around them is um, properties and, and things like that. So we go out and do these big tours all around Australia. Our country is huge, just as big as America, but oh, yeah. way less people. Mm -hmm and way, le way less towns. Um, so it, I was in the middle of that. I was like in far north Queensland, you know, 20 something hours away with my car, my caravan, my kids. And I started literally, you know, overnight got all these text messages saying, you know, um, come home, the tour's over. My entire year got canceled. And I was like, huh, I have no work. Um, okay. So I drove home and got across the border just before they closed the, the Queensland border to New South Wales, which is where I'm from. Went back you know, into my house and into isolation and, and started working on the record. And I was kind of going through boxes and, um, you know, memorabilia and stuff because my parents, of course, during COVID decided to clean out their house. Super mm -hmm. fun. So they called all of us kids. I got three older brothers. They called all of us kids and said, come get your stuff out of our house that's been here for, you know, 20 years, 30 years. So we all got gifted all this crap, basically. And I got all my memorabilia that mum and dad have been collecting for 20-something years. Um, huge tubs, like massive tubs of stuff. And I started digging through everything during COVID just in my studio out the back of my house and, um, you know, just realizing how great it is, A, that I've been able to do this for so long. Um, you know, I feel like a veteran and I'm 36. You know, I feel super old. Um, but it's probably because I've been on the road my whole life. But, you know, I've been really fortunate and it's all because of the fans. Like it's all because mm -hmm. they have been there from day one and they have bought my records and they come to the shows and, you know, I can always rely on them. You get to some of these gigs and, and you, you know, you go, where have you guys come from? Whatever. And they're like, oh, we drove four hours from blah, 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 because this was the closest show we could get to. And you're like, what? You drove four hours to come to this gig? Like, who does that? A country fan does that, you know, like it's just crazy. Yeah. They're just, they're so passionate. They believe in you. They know your story. They follow you. 
your story and, and, and they're so invested and it blows my mind and I knew Lee Kernigan would get it. He's been doing this even mm-hmm. longer than me and I reached out to him and said, look, I've got this song. I feel like you get where it's coming from. Uh, and Lee asked me to sing on one of his records um, when I was just a kid starting out. We sang a mm-hmm. duet called Love Hurts, the old Felice and Budlo Bryant classic. Um, you know, Love Hurts, yeah. that one. Oh, yeah. So we did yeah. that as a duet together and um, it really, you know, blew up my career here in Australia. So I always thought I want to, you know, pay him back and have him on one of my records one day. So this song just felt perfect for us and uh, he loved it, thankfully, and we released it. Uh, that's actually the current single here in Australia right mm-hmm. now. So, yeah. A beautiful song. Well, well, you know, you, I know we all went through this, the, our version of this this COVID thing, which kind of forced us all to be kind of more introspective. And I know that at least I read a a few things, you know, when you talk about this being your first independent record, I read somewhere something about, you know, your band playing on the record. Now, is that not normally what happens with you? Do you not normally use your guys on your record? Was this a new thing? Well, no, because um, I generally, you know, I, I've always gone somewhere else or something to make a record. Right. So, you know, um, my first album was independent and made here in Australia. Then I went over to Nashville and did Too Far Gone and Little Wild Flower with yeah. Keith, Keith Stiegel and then uh, Brett Beavers. So that was their bands that they chose. I mean, amazing bands. Like Too Far right. Gone was the A-team, you know, Nashville players. It was ridiculous. Um, Brett Mason and all those guys. Um, and then when I came back to Australia, uh, I went to, I met back up with the Chambers family and we, we made a record down in Melbourne and we mm-hmm. ended up getting all these Melbourne players, um, which is another, just so you know, another state from where I live. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, let's see, after that, I went over to Austin and made a record in Jimmy Lou Fave studio. Uh, mm-hmm. that was always never enough. And then Bone Shaker was in Seattle and, um, the last record though, before this one, Catherine Britt and the Cold Cold Hearts was, um, a really stripped back organic bluegrass almost record that we made in my home studio out the back of my house. Um, and you know, that was because I, I'd been through, I don't know if you guys know, but I, I, I was diagnosed with breast cancer at 30 and mm-hmm. I'd just been through all of that stuff and I just wanted to stay close to home and make a record, you know, with my friends. And that was just a couple of my best mates and me sitting around. We made the whole record live in a circle and... Um, So this album was different again. It was like my touring band and um, it's, you know, a lot more commercial and a lot, you know, got drums in it. Whoa, can you believe it? Um, So it's, you know, a little different again to to the Cold Cold Hearts record. So, um, and, you know, I got to have full creative control as I mostly do anyway. I mean, Mm -hmm. I say that like I haven't or always had that, but, you know, I feel like it was all me. You know, I I crowdfunded the record. I, I funded the record. I started my own record label, Beverly Hillbilly Records that we released it through. And um, this whole thing, I bought back my publishing. Uh, I'm fully independent. I, I even book my own shows now. So I booked the entire Bush Pubs tour myself with a, with a team of people. So I kind of have just like hand picked my favorite people that I've ever worked with over the last 20 years and just said, okay, I want to hire you to come and work with me because you're awesome at your job. Um, so it's been great. It's been a wonderful experience, a big learning curve. It was like relearning the music business all over again because I was so green when it came to releasing an album. I was, I had no idea what, what went into all of this stuff. You know, I've right. always been on major labels. I've always been surrounded by a huge team of people that do everything for me and, you know, consult with me, but they do the work and I get it now, you know, uh-huh. they, they work hard. <laughs> so I've just taken all that on and um, it's been full on, but I love it. I feel very, um, well, and- yeah. Well, and, and that was that was the other part of that question about this record, because, you know, when you when you consider the the journey that you went through and your family went through together yeah. and and then you 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 reflect back on things like we're all waiting, yeah. you know, that project to, to know all of that went on and then to read that this album is the most personal album. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It, it's like it's like how how with all of that reflected mm-hmm. in it, certainly some of your music, you know, yeah. around all of that time, yeah. you know, what what made this project so much more personal than what was going on in your world at that time? You know, that's well, I think at that time, so Bone Shaker came out. Um, uh, that was before I was diagnosed. So Bone Shaker came out, and then a week later, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. 
Okay. Um, so where awaiting became, you know, the video, we, we changed the concept of the video to be, you know, about, I don't, you can look it up on YouTube if you haven't yeah. seen it. It's, you know, myself being bald and going around in my mm -hmm. hometown and giving out flowers and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, it, it was just such a crazy time that I think I just kind of went into survival mode and, um, you know, we did big fundraisers for Breast Cancer Foundation here in Australia, the McGrath Foundation and a huge shows around Australia, these FU Cancer shows and released a single here called FU Cancer. So it kind of all became about that for a bit. And, you know, I just, I think I was in survival mode and, and coping yeah. mode. And then when I realized I was going to be okay and I was going to live and I just had to do this treatment and I came out the other side of the treatment and that really knocked me for six, you know, for a while. Um, I was pretty sick and um, tired and just run down. And I looked like a totally different person. Mm -hmm. um, I think only now, you know, it's I'm almost six years cancer free. And I think only really now I'm starting to feel like myself again. You yeah. know, um, my hair's back and, you know, I've got two kids now. Um, I, I was able to have children, which they weren't sure if I was going to be able to do that after the chemotherapy. I was able to have two little boys who were three and one and they just, they're awesome. Um, and I, yeah, I just feel like a, I'm really in a place now where I know exactly who I am and I know exactly what I want and I know that there's not really anybody sort of needing to tell me or guide me anymore. I don't mm -hmm. feel like a kid, you know, my entire career I felt like a little bit of a kid because I started out so young. So even to this day, people in the industry still treat me like a kid. Because I'm that I'm that little girl that started out at 14 right. you know, in their mind mm -hmm. still. So, um, yeah, I think it's just really this album and sitting down and writing it and actually having the space to write an album. When do you ever get the time to actually sit down and not be in the middle of a tour or in the middle of something? Right. You know, I actually had six months off to write and record an album, you know, and just focus on that. And I was going through all my life and I'm in these boxes and looking through those early days of my career and going, huh, that's not right. You know, like reading emails and stuff from like people I used to work with and then going, I think I had the wool pulled over, pulled over my eyes there, you know, mm -hmm. just having no idea of course at the time. I was so young, but yeah, I think it just all came out in this music, you know. Um, yeah. It's really personal. It's really honest. I didn't hold back on anything. Um, not that I ever really do, but I think I really just sort of let it fly on this record. So I'm really proud of that. And yeah, I know every artist says this, oh, my new, my new work's my best work, and, you know, it's so lame, but it's true. I really feel like it is. I really feel like it is the best work I've ever done because I had the space to do it properly, and I did it by myself. You know, I got to kind of put it all together, mm -hmm. um, and that felt really cool, you know, felt really good, so, yeah. It's, it's uh, I mean, a couple of more I'm just going to bring attention to on there um, was uh, going to be Mama, which, which is a beautiful song yeah. there, Make a Diamond. Um, and, and you let your heart and soul you put you put into it, and I think a lot of the fans can see out there, including uh, some of the people I talked to today, just friends and family. They they really love this record, and I think a lot of people uh, can can resonate and feel what you're talking about, the honesty and the truth, and uh, the home truth, which is out there too. Well, uh, I'm ready to hear that beautiful voice once again here <laughs> on the show. She sure. doesn't matter what time of the day it is, she can sing like a dickie. So, <laughs> Miss Britt, it's all yours. All right, I thought. Um... <laughs> A good way to end would be on the title track. You've said Home Truths a few times, and um, this is probably going to be a single coming out um, really soon as well. This will be the final single from the record. Um, and this is a song I wrote with a, a dear friend of mine here in Australia. Her name is Melody Moko, and um, so talented. And um, we sat down and wrote this song, yeah, about partners. Um, you know, having a good partner, I guess, that, you know, in our job, it's, it just does not go hand in hand with relationships or being a mother, to be honest. <laughs> um, it just doesn't, doesn't work together. But um, this song's about having somebody that understands that and um, supports that, you know, which she had at the time. So we kind of wrote about her relationship and I wish to have one day. So here we go. Sunday morning, no one wants to be heard. Run your nails down my backbone, and you clean my shirt. You drag me through the fire while the clothes are still warm. It feels like a love, but I wish I never was born. Give me those home truths, honest, straight, and hundred proof. Say, you feel the 
change Hits me like a greyhound bus Damn it all so true pour is comprised of a sweet corn mash base. The front has a subtle sweetness and not too sharp. It has notes of a medium char or white oak for a smoky flavor in the middle and the tail has a super smooth and warm finish. Yeah, she can sing that phone book from A to Z, no doubt. Home Truths is out there across all the digital platforms. The great and talented Catherine Britt here as we finish up here in the next minute or so. And I just want to thank you for being on the show, first of all, as we do another question or two. But thank you for doing this. And um, I know we had a little the scheduling, but I know what it's like to be a parent, too, at the same time. you got to, those kids have to be looked after. And just wanted to say yeah. thank you for uh, taking the time to join us here over in, on the uh, Backstage Pass. And honestly, uh, would love to have you back here in, in 21 to stay yeah. on the Catherine Britt bus to see how the tour is going and the shows and <laughs> Of course, this record and many other great projects coming out. So let me ask you and this. this look, and this, there is a Catherine Britt bust. I've been hearing <laughs> about this interview. Yes. I've been hearing about yeah. this. Yeah. My phone blows up <laughs> because of you. Well, I, I did text him several times uh, as we were doing this. And that's how much I'm a fan. And I, I wanted to thank you for doing this because I believe in, in you as an artist, as a person, and also... Um, yeah, it, it just it makes a lot of sense when you can really connect with someone's music as as, as beautiful as yours. Um, so let me ask you this. If Catherine Britt is having a night at home where she's just ordering a pizza and the pizza is just for awesome. her and she's putting toppings on it and yeah. Jeff and I can't have a slice. If you invite us over and we're like, no, this is Catherine Britt's pizza. What are you putting on it? Uh, look, I'm, I'm a total Supreme girl. I know okay. that's so generic, isn't it? <laughs> wow. I just felt I felt like such a generic person just now. But yeah, I love Supreme with anchovies um, and some chili flakes. That's me. That's happy me. Anchovies. Man, I, I that, shouldn't that's judge. That's not generic. <laughs> <laughs> that is clearly not generic. I feel like in Australia that's super generic, but okay, maybe not. Chili flakes. Now, how does that taste? I've never. It's just heard of it. adds a little bit of spice. Oh, that's okay. Kind of like the kind of like the red pepper. Yeah, what you're saying. Yes, the red yeah, pepper. Yeah, yeah. Over here. So and yeah, chilies. I, you have chilies. Like chilies. Though, yes, right? I do yeah. like the red pepper. I was getting a little confused there. All right, let me ask this: Catherine Britt's favorite 
binge watching programs on TV. Oh, right now, I'm right super now, obsessed. Or? Yeah, I'm super okay. obsessed with Outlander. Have you guys okay. seen that? I've never seen previews. So of good. Oh my god, it's so good. It's about a girl <laughs> that travels back in time. Yeah, it's awesome. Anyway, I won't give the the plot away. Um, that's my new obsession. Um, and then next, I'm I'm going to show my friends. He's he's never seen Game of Thrones, so I'm going to go Ooh. down that road again. Yeah. Yes. Love the Game of Thrones world. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm a bit of a I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to with TV and movies and stuff. You know, I'm like the person that lines up uh, when the new Lord of the Rings comes out or um, Harry Potter or whatever. So I'm that girl. Hi. Are you Are you watching them in costume? Oh, okay. No, I'm not that girl. Okay. <laughs> I draw a line there, but I do okay. look. I do have very, um, very geeky ways, and I'm super proud of it. There's no, uh, nothing. <laughs> hey, no, no shame here. I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you come over, even if you're slithering. Well, there you Thank go. You. I'm, I'm a team. Gryffindor, so I. But I will say that the slithering is. Uh, I thought, uh, and, and I'm with you too. We got to have some great conversations when we meet in person because there's some Potter mm. stories and Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. So you'll have some of my behind the scenes stories that I was like you, I was in line, ready to watch it at the theaters yeah. when it came out, when we could go to theaters back then. And yeah, um, yeah I, I would not wear the costume, but I did have to see the series and enjoy uh, those yeah. great movies, which are great out there. And I probably will pass them down to my daughter. We just had a baby girl last year. So um, oh, she just turned one last fr a couple of Fridays ago. So definitely wow. uh, something to pass, to pass down, good times. Great with yeah. the music. Um, Home Truths is out there across all the digital platforms. CatherineBritt.com and give her a like if you haven't already across all the socials. Uh, Catherine, appreciate the time and would look forward to uh, doing this again. Thanks so much for being on. Yeah, I'd love to come and meet you guys in person hopefully next year. We're planning on 2022 to come back to the U.S. So thank you <laughs> right, so much. Back. It's been We're a pleasure. Be. Thank you so much. And, of course, tomorrow uh, Carly Ryan is going to stop by. And if you're a rock fan like I am, Jeff, I've been looking forward to this. The lead singer and co-founder, I should say co-founder, of the band Saliva. Bobby's going to stop by. Saliva's promoting a new EP tomorrow on the show. Y'all remember Click, Click, Boom? Come on, Jeff. Click, Click, Boom. <laughs> so that's coming <laughs> on tomorrow. Bobby's going to come on with Saliva. And then next week, uh, some more cool stuff. Stoney LaRue is going to stop by. We'll talk some Texas country and a whole lot more here on the Backstage Pass presented by Tour Guitars and, of course, uh, Bangtail. Whiskey, we'll see you guys tomorrow for a TGIF version of the Backstage Pass. And be sure to stay tuned.